Okay, great. Thank you, Grace. I would like to thank Grace Kaufman, our project leader for our Food Hub project and for all the work she's done to pull everything together here. Welcome to all of you. We're so glad to have you with us this afternoon. We're going to share an update on the Esparto Food Hub Network facility, which is very exciting, and the results of a survey that we've been conducting with institutional buyers across the region. And uh, all of our logos here represent the network of partners who are engaged in this project. Valley Vision is a regional civic leadership organization, nonprofit, and we are helping to support this project, which is a feasibility study and business plan for the Yellow Food Hub. And um, this is a project that is funded through USDA. We're very grateful for that support. And you'll hear later today from our partners, uh, New Season Development and others around the site acquisition, which has been uh, generously supported by Yolo County Board of Supervisors. So um, we're gonna give a little bit of an overview of how we got to um, uh, this point with the project and give you some results of current work that we're doing. We're gonna hear an update about the status of the, the facility property and then talk a little bit about some next steps. So if you would be uh, very kind as to put your name in the chat and your organization, and we have an icebreaker that Grace has thought up, which is what food item are you lo most looking forward to as we come into the fall season? So I just wanna thank everybody again. We had a webinar a few months ago for the uh, first part of this project that was a result of surveys with the growers in the region and what kind of things would be they would be looking for for support from a food hub to help them connect to broader markets. And we had over 100 people and really we're just so grateful for the support and enthusiasm of all of you. So we really appreciate hearing where you're from. And I think when you look in the chat, you'll see just a broad network of people, which is really, you know, so many of us that are trying to advance our regional food system. So um, Grace, if you want to go on to the next slide. So in 2013 and 14, Valley Vision and other partners worked through the Sacramento Area Council of Governments through their Rural Urban Connection Strategy Project to do a feasibility for a food hub. And a food hub, as you know, is a site that aggregates and um, distributes food and it, it's an opportunity for smaller growers, especially to reach the marketplace. And it allows for more local consumption of regionally and locally grown food. And so food hubs strengthen re local food systems because not only do they provide expanded market opportunities, but they also um, support the local economy and the money that institutions spend for food procurement can be more invested in the region. And what we did find though, is that even though there is a strong and growing interest in procuring local produce through food hubs, there are a lot of barriers to local institutional procurement. So we did a lot of outreach at the time with growers and local governments and potential purchasing partners like hospitals and schools. But um, even though the food hub study showed that uh, the food hub could be economically viable, we did not have a partner to advance the project. Uh, next slide, Grace. So what we learned, of course, all of us have seen through COVID is that uh, there was huge disruption of the supply chain, increasing levels of food insecurity, and just lots of challenges, uh, frontline workers, farm, farm, farm workers, farmers, people in grocery stores, uh, food processing, all these frontline uh, workers subjected to health challenges and this disruption of the supply chain. What we saw is that our grocery stores and others that had relationships with growers and distribution companies had a better uh, access to a sustainable food supply. In the meantime, just nationally, there's, and locally and regionally and statewide, there's an increasing growing interest in buying local. And a lot of our institutions have tried to um, adjust their purchasing and procurement practices. We have leaders like Sac City Unified, Winter School District, Davis School District, uh, UC Davis Health, UC Davis, 
the King, Sacramento Kings, buying more and more locally in that interest. So when the pandemic hit, the leadership in Yolo County, who had been engaged in the earlier food hub work, provided funding to New Season Development Corporation, a nonprofit in Cape Hay Valley, to um, develop the food hub. And so this is really the um, opportunity now to be responsive also to new public policy initi initiatives such as the Farm to School program from the state and the federal uh, funding that was coming for the recovery. So uh, we're trying to take advantage of all of these opportunities to strengthen the resiliency of our food system. And when we received the grant from USDA, the goal was to hear from growers about what services and support they need to help them get connected to broader markets. And so we did a survey of farmers in the spring and Lan Hatamiya, who's our wonderful consultant, gave an update on that on an earlier webinar. And in the meantime, New Seasons Development and the partners secured a site, which you'll hear about from Jim Durst and um, Maria McFarish. And then Right now, we've been in the process of surveying potential institutional buyers to find out what their needs and demands are and what role a hub could play for them. And uh, you're going to hear the survey results today, and we're still doing some outreach. Uh, so very interested to hear uh, uh, from any input from people on the site today. And I wanna make sure, of course, to note the critical important role that our food banks and our food bank network um, emergency services and, and other food system partners are playing in this work. What we are planning for next and what we're working on is we're looking at models for food hub networks. This isn't a standalone enterprise. We're working with Spork Food Hub, for instance, and KPay Farm Shop, and there's new uh, hub sites coming up across the region. So we really are excited about the opportunity to create a network across the region. And we're looking at other operating and governance models that can help inform how we structure the operating plan for the hub. And we're looking at a funding strategy to raise the rest of the funding for the facility. There's um, a lot of retrofitting we need to do, but we kind of want to have a state of the art, environmentally sustainable facility and uh, so looking at a lot of uh, mechanisms there and then we're updating the business plan and uh, we'll be ready to advance the food hub and make this vision a reality. So with that, I would like to turn it over to our consultant, Lan Hatamiya from the Hatamiya Group who conducted our survey of institutional buyers and he's going to give us um, an overview of the findings to date. So Lon, take it away. Trish, thank you very much. And to put it in, let me put the um, survey into context before I get, jump into the, the actual results. Uh, I was also a co-author of that SACOG study that Trish had mentioned. And I just want to make a couple of observations about our region that I think are extremely important. Um, we have almost 1.5 million acres of farmland and more than 7,200 farms and ranches. And that's basically the SACOG, six counties in the six, uh, SACOG region. So if you add some of the other neighboring counties, it adds to that total. We also produce more than 150 crops, uh, totaling over 3.4 million tons of agricultural production. So there's a huge diversity already existing in our region that we need to take fuller advantage of. So let, let me transition now into kind of the, the uh, institutional buyer survey that we are at least at this point in the preliminary stage and I'm gonna share some of the initial findings. And Grace, do I have the ability? I do, okay, let me see if I can share my screen. Oops, wrong one. We can see your screen. Yeah, this is the wrong, let me get to the, okay, here we go. Can you all see the question number one on the survey? We are seeing your desktop background. Okay, so maybe you're getting, how about now? Yes. Okay, you can all see that. Okay, good, sorry about that. So let me give you a, a few highlights to start off with. As Trish had shared with you, this is a second of two surveys that we sent out. We've done it through an online survey system through SurveyMonkey. Uh, we've reached out to a number of different institutional establishments 
throughout the region and throughout the state. And there were a series of 32 questions that we created, and I'm going to highlight a few of those and some of the findings to those. But there are four major sections of this buyer survey. The first was the type of buyer. The second was, you know, whether there are buy local and existing purchasing requirements that these uh, suppliers, uh, buyers currently uh, implement. The third section is what is their product demand? What are they currently procuring? And lastly, the fourth section was um, an identification of services that potentially could be used and offered by the food hub to these institutional buyers. So let me jump into the, the section number one, and I'm gonna go through these rather quickly. And if there are questions, I'm, I'm happy to answer those at the end. What I did with the supplier survey the last time was to provide, I think, all of the participants in the webinar, a executive summary of our finding. Uh, again, I wanna uh, preface this by saying, these are preliminary results, and we would like to encourage even further responses to this survey. So let me jump into this. Currently, we've received 22 responses to the survey, which I think is a, is a pretty good response rate. But as you can see from this first slide, there are gaps in, in, in responses. We have an excellent response rate from K through 12 school districts, but we're still lagging in community colleges, university and colleges, health and healthcare facilities, elder care facilities, prisons and jails, uh, corporate kitchens. We have some responses from tribal owned casinos, but also you know, hotels, entertainment uh, supports and other convention areas. Some good responses from restaurants, grocery stores, food banks and others. So I'll just mention it really quickly as you can see these numbers here, about 43% of our responses are from school districts. Uh, roughly 5% are from tribal owned casinos, another 5% from restaurant chains, and 24% uh, from grocery stores and grocery chains, and then about 10% from local food banks, and then um, a, a smattering of others for 20% of responses. Big question is where are the food that they are purchasing being served? And we had a wide range of counties that we listed for those of you that have not had a chance to see it. We listed most of the counties in Northern California, as well as many in the Bay Area, and to some extent in Southern California. You can see there is a wide range of where the food they're purchasing is being currently served. So currently the, the vast majority are Yolo County responses, about 37% about 28% Sacramento County. And then as you can see, as it goes down from here, 30% to Placer, El Dorado, Solano, Yuba and Sutter, and then others with uh, like responses, Calusa, Nevada. And interestingly enough, we have responses also in the Bay Area, San Francisco, Alameda, Contra Costa, Santa Clara, San Mateo, and then some in the Tahoe Basin and, a, and one response from Southern California. Important question we asked too is, do you have a buy local policy? And this goes to our second section that I mentioned about, you know, do, do institutional buyers actually consider buying local? And as you can see here, a vast majority of the responses did. About 81% have buy local policies and a little, little less than 20% do not. And I, we also asked the question, if you don't have one, would you like to buy more products that are locally grown? And as you can see here, those that don't have buy local products, 100% uh, of them said absolutely they would buy more products that are locally grown if they had a system to do so. Question five, you know, if we currently purchase food products from local sources, how do you acquire them? And there are a number of different ways they acquire local foods, uh, principally from local food distributors, about 62%. Those include like General Produce, Produce Express, Greenleaf, Fresh and Best Produce, et cetera, locally. Uh, a, a third uh, acquired it, uh, their produce from national food distributors like Cisco, U.S. Foods. And about 57% are purchasing directly from growers. And about almost 30% are, are currently purchasing from local food hubs and to some extent. And then the remainder are a mixture of responses, I believe. Uh, you, you see below here, USDA commodity entitlements, um, some other local grocers, 
from the stores and uh, again from uh, local neighbors. Question number six, what challenges have you faced when attempting to purchase locally grown foods? And this is an important factor to determine, you know, how can we lower these challenges and barriers to entry for locally produced foods? So I'm gonna move down to the questions so you can read them. You can see the responses here, um, but I wanna show you very specifically um, the, one of the major ones are finding products at a desired price point. Another one was finding suppliers with required certifications, uh, GAP certifications and other food safety certifications are important. Um, one challenge is knowing how to procure directly from local farms. And that's one of the things that we hope the Food Hub Network uh, can provide. And, and uh, another important one is handling a product from local producers. Uh, from transportation to cooling and, and storing. And again, that's another factor that a food hub can certainly supply. And another challenge is also a, a, a question about su sufficient volumes of locally grown food. And as I think from our sur uh, grower survey that we provided earlier this year, we know that there are su sufficient volumes. We just need to make that connection between the grower and the ultimate buyer. And lastly, the cost, and that's an issue that we have some additional questions that I'll address here in just a minute. Another question is, you're currently integrating products from local farms into your menus or food offerings. And again, a vast majority of the responses, uh, over 71% said absolutely yes, and a little less than 30% said no. And again, we asked if you said no, would you be willing to integrate products from local farms? And again, resoundingly, 100% of those that had no response to not currently using them definitely said they would if they had the ability to integrate local products. Important question too is, could you team benefit from local procurement training to implement menu, food offering, planning, purchasing, and preparing seasonal produce? Again, this is an overwhelming response that uh, nearly 74% said absolutely that they would uh, uh, certainly benefit from this type of offering from a food hub. So we're very pleased to see this. Question 10, if the Yellow Food Hub Network offered collaborative planning service for development of seasonal menus, would your company be interested in utilizing these services? And again, even in a more resounding fashion, nearly 90% of the responses said absolutely yes. So this is also very encouraging in terms of the responses we've received. And again, if you answered no to that question, would you be willing to direct your chefs uh, and the nutrition specialist to engage in collaborative planning? And again, 75% uh, of those said absolutely yes. So that's a, another good indication of the type of services that we can develop and provide. Another question is, do you currently encourage or require your chefs, food and nutrition service specialists to order from local products availability lists? And again, a little over 55% currently do, uh, a little less than 45% currently do not. And again, we answered those that answered no, would you be willing? And again, overwhelmingly, they, they were absolutely uh, willing to provide, local, uh, buy from local products availability lists if they were uh, provided. So this is another good indication that the establishment of a Yellow Food Hub network would be very, very productive. Question 14, do you retain some level of pricing tolerance for locally sourced products? Uh, I'll, I'll uh, harken back to that initial question about what are some of the barriers. Uh, the barrier, one of the barriers was cost, but this answer tells you that uh, they may have, buyers may have a pricing tolerance for locally sourced products, meaning uh, if they could get the products that they need, they may be willing to pay a little higher price for locally sourced products. And that's something we'll need to delve into a little bit further. Again, if you answered no, would you be willing to develop a level of pricing tolerance? And again, 75% uh, said they definitely would be uh, if we could develop that process with the Yellow Food Hub Network. Question 16, do you have an interest in the Yellow Food Hub providing market readiness training for local growers less, less experienced in selling wholesale? Um, again, nearly 77% of the respondents said absolutely they would have interest if we could provide from the Yellow Food Hub Network uh, better training for local growers to sell to them in a wholesale way. 
Then let's transition a bit to, to asking a question to these specific growers. Do you have special programs or policies in place that support, support local growers? And as you can see here, a very small fraction currently do, and the vast majority do not. And those that said, if they do, yes, you know, what are, what are some of the policies? Um, and, and as you can see below here, some purchase exclusively from local growers. Uh, others have a yellow, yellow grown program. I'm presuming some of these are coming from some of the school districts. And farmers listed on menus uh, are also, especially crop growers, um, with expected availability also uh, are available. So these are some answers that I think we'll, we'll take into consideration and determine how we can best incorporate that into the overall business plan for the Yellow Food Hub. Again, we ask that same question. If you answered no, would you be willing to develop programs? And again, overwhelmingly, 91% said absolutely they would be. Question 19 is a critical one for forward uh, contracting. Would you be willing to enter into forward contracts with the Yellow Food Hub Network to purchase locally grown products? Again, 60% said yes, and 40% said no. And then let me move now to section three for product demand. What are institutional buyers looking at purchasing from the Yellow Food Hub? And these are the types of uh, products that they currently pr uh, purchase. Fresh fruits and vegetables, overwhelmingly. Uh, minimally, pr minimally processed uh, products, frozen fruit, frozen vegetables, nuts, grains, fresh meats, and, and down the line. And as you can see here, obviously fresh fruits and vegetables, 100%. Probably being the greatest demand. Um, I was surprised too that grains, uh, about 70, almost 75% uh, would, would, are currently purchasing grains, but we'd be willing to purchase them locally. And as you can see, beyond just fresh produce, there are also demands for eggs, dairy, baked goods, and to a lesser extent, an organic preference. Second question is what types of products do you currently purchase from local sources? And as you can see here, there's a mix. Most uh, that are buying locally are buying fresh fruits and vegetables, some minimally processed, some fresh meats and poultry. I'll move down here as you can see the percentages that are being done. Um, interestingly enough, about 10% of the respondents are not purchasing anything locally. Uh, but again, the vast majority, 90% are. And there's a mix here, as you can see it. This next question asks basically what quantities of the above listed uh, products. And again, I'm not going to walk through those because there are many different answers to that. Uh, but that's something that will uh, itemize and determine uh, what are some of the largest demanded products uh, in a mix that we could provide. Question number 23, what are your food safety requirements that growers must meet in order to work with you? Um, again, uh, there are a number, but the most uh, recognizable being the GAP and USDA harmonized GAP plus audit or good hygiene practices certification. Also USDA certified for meat products. And as you can see here, other third party certifications, just a mix of some other food safety requirements that they would uh, necessarily need in purchase of products. Again, we also asked a question about what do you require of local suppliers in terms of packing standards. Again, there was a wide mixture of those, uh, principally probably meeting their quality standards, uh, 55%. Uh, maintain cold chain is another important aspect of a supply chain. Also following USDA grading standards and meeting their own packing specifications are also ones that are very important to institutional buyers. Last one, the, the next question is a very specific question. If you, if you utilize reusable food containers, will you accept products without individual labeling? Um, and and uh, there is a vast majority said yes. And that's certainly uh, for sustainability and uh, recycling of, of, of uh, food containers. And that's something that I think that we'll continue to focus in on too as what makes the most sense for the Yellow Food Hub to implement. Another question we asked, what percentage of your fresh and processed food purchases are seconds, uh, meaning what pro pr products that cannot reach the highest market size uh, or uh, quality due to size, shape, or minor blemishes? 
And as you could see, uh, uh, there were quite a few that said uh, they would re be responsive. About 11 said they definitely would, uh, would be, be responsive to receiving those. And then the last several questions we have are, are who are you currently serving? Approximately how much of your food serves the elder, elderly here? Um, you know, there's a wide range. There, there's certainly about, I think, 19% of those do provide elderly service. Again, approximately how much of your food serves K through 12 or other higher education students? 13 answered this question. And um, again, I think those are most of the school districts that we had. And question 29, approximately how much of your food serves low income or other high risk individuals? Again, a high number uh, obviously do that, but again, only 15 out of the 22 answer this question. Question 30, if some of all of your purchasing requirements could be met, would you be willing to purchase products from the locally sourced Yellow Food Hub Network? And as you could see, 100% of those that answered this question said yes, most definitely, that they, could, they would be interested in purchasing locally sourced products from the Yellow Food Hub Network. Um, question 31 was just a follow-up question, whether they'd be willing to have follow-up discussions or meetings. I'm glad to see so many said yes, uh, because after this buyer survey, we're gonna reach out to individuals uh, to further delve into their answers. And again, question 32 was just uh, thanking them for their participation and other comments or a varied number of comments. But that pretty much sums up the findings that we have in those four sections. And I'm happy to answer any questions anybody might have. Thank you very much, Lon. Very rich data, but um, as Lon mentioned, you know, we're still gathering information and um, really so many important categories of information that we would like to capture. So we hope that we do get some questions from you all. So, um, and one of the can, things that I would yeah. last like to ask everyone, Trish, is I look mm -hmm. through the list of participants today. If you have contacts within some of these institutional buying networks, we would appreciate if you could send this survey along to them. Uh, because again, as yeah. I said, these are preliminary results, but we certainly would love to include much more input as we develop our ultimate business plan. So anything you could do, especially in the areas of colleges, universities, health facilities, um, county jails, local jails, some of those facilities would really be uh, appreciated. Uh, school districts as well. Um, we have a good response, but even more school districts would be, I think when we send this out, they were not yet back in session. So I'm hoping that we get more responses from school districts now that most schools in the areas are, are back in, in school. Thanks, Trish. Yeah, thank you so much, Lon. And one thing I wanted to note is that you know, th through this process, we're trying to get better organized across our food system because uh, these are lots of different networks. So we want to build an information base so that we're able to get, um, you know, more systematically information about this. So there is a hand up from David. Um, uh, Grace, does he, you need to unmute him or? I think I'm unmuted. Is that right? Okay, go ahead. Okay, you ask? sorry. Yes. Just figuring out how to navigate this thing. I, I was just going to ask um, how many of the, you know, the positive responses were conditioned by price sensitivity. And it seems if there's no cost in the, you know, in the question, if there's no cost to sourcing locally, of course, everybody's going to say, sure, um, they'd like to. And I'm just sort of wondering if that was included in the survey, an assumption of you know, equal pricing or that there would be, um, uh, more that, that, that anything through a food hub would be more exp expensive. In, in answer to that question, I, I think I did reference a question that we asked about, you know, would they be willing to take a look at, you know, price sensitivity, willing to spend mm -hmm. a bit more for locally produced products? And as you, as I think, as I uh, referenced, uh, overwhelming number said yes, they have some level of pricing tolerance uh, for locally yeah. produced products. So. I think that we need to delve into that further. What does that actually yeah. mean? Is that 10% right. more? Is that 5% more? I just don't know the answer to that. Right, right. I think it's it's really critical to break down what are the added values we're proposing in addition to local, because I think there's quite a few 
others that are, you know that you've mentioned already but that in the survey tool it's it's you know it's good to know that the respondents are taking that into consideration. Great question. I think Santana has his hand up as well. Yes. You know, it's it's good information here. At the same time, uh, I, I believe we're all on the same page of understanding that this is not cheaper, right? And it's not even going to be close to commodity pricing, uh, right? I know that that's for our program. We understand that um, we don't tell the farmers what uh, what we're going to pay. Um, I mean, it's just, let's be realistic, you know, um, you know, Jim Durst is on the, on this call. It's like, so his labor here in California, any California labor to pick a tomato is going to be more expensive when it's picked here in California than comparing it to a tomato in Mexico. So there's no way that it could ever be, doesn't matter what the volume is, it'll never be commodity pricing. So, we, I mean, that's the benefit is something that we have to, the, the value added benefit is is where we have to be coming from a position of together um as as a whole um and what is it whether that benefit is the measure of community benefit and those community dollars staying within our community um and that value add uh because if we just base it solely on on costs uh not only will our region lose uh i mean california just loses across the board any any way any, for any produce produce that we're trying to source locally right just kind of wanted to throw that in there um it's never going to be commodity pricing and santana how do we message around that to make the case you mentioned things like keeping dollars in the community um what are the how do we collectively you know make that case because there there have been added economic benefits might be just not being the immediate pricing i would suggest uh throwing in jobs right how many jobs are we securing locally um you know the whole supply chain all the way there right so the blockchain if you will from the farm to our institution who benefits right mm -hmm. because uh, if you line up who benefits if we're just ordering tomatoes off a u.s foods truck or off of cisco who's benefiting there right so we'd be increasing the value of the dollar of how much percentage the farmer actually gets of that dollar it not being 12 to 16 cents on the dollar, maybe it's more, right? Mm -hmm. Or actually it's a lot more. Uh, and we're reducing how many people are the touch points between there, or at least those touch points are touch points within our region and our community. Mm -hmm. That's the mm -hmm. benefit, right? Mm -hmm. And so that's not measured on the price per case per se right now on on some beets from River Dog Farm, right? Right. So uh, I think that's the the part to exploit and, and mm -hmm. because we're not going to get around, it's not going to be successful if we try to just say, oh, if we just do more volume, it's going to drive the price down. It mm -hmm. doesn't work for California. Mm -hmm. That's what I've seen, at least. Yeah, well, you're right on the front line. So, you know, you're experiencing that. But I think you've seen, you've been able to communicate the benefit because you've increased your sourcing a lot and helped um, set the supply chains better, too, for that. So. Thank you, Santana. We'll be looping back with you for sure too on on some of the questions. Um, Tammy, you have your hand up also. Yeah, thanks. Um, so I'm also curious, you know, in all these surveys and everything, like I would really like to get a sense of, you know, from the institutional, you know, purchasing in terms of, you know, whether or not they care about organic versus conventionally grown. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's an interesting question because um, th there are values around locally sourced and the sustainable practices that growers do use without necessarily being certified organic. I don't know, I could punt this question back to Santana um, if you wouldn't mind addressing that question, Santana, how do you um, consider that? The organic versus the non-organic and health related aspects. There's still a lot of uh, a jury still out, if you will, on research to 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 really say is there a benefit there? There isn't enough data. Um, you know, we're from our perspective right now, we're we would kind of going on the hunch of knowing that okay, if you have less pesticides sprayed on your food, that it would uh, result in a healthier 
uh, non-food related uh, disease outcomes within our healthcare system, right? But uh, that has yet to be completely proven. Um, so we're just erring on that side of knowing that this is good for climate. Um, you know, climate health is another value add there that we need to focus on too, because uh, you can't always just apply that to the cost, right? Uh, to the bottom line p &L. So we are, so short answer, we don't have any information on that. Um, we're going to start collecting that data with hopeful new grants in the future. Great. And, Thank and you. Trish, if I can yeah. weigh in on that, as, uh -huh. as someone who was the administrator of the Agricultural Marketing Service when the National Organic Standards were created, I have a little background in this uh, area. Uh, more importantly, though, I'll, I'll just turn to the survey results. Out of the 22 responses, only six had an organic preference. Now, again, I don't know if that's a, a reflection of the responses we receive, or is that a broader reflection of what the market is bearing? And I, I do uh, acknowledge Santana's comments as well, too. You know, again, there are many benefits to it, but again, scientifically, that's a question that needs to be answered by the ultimate buyer, and that's a choice. But in this case, only six had an organic preference. So uh, that was an interesting, that was one of the, the, the responses that really jumped out at me. I thought it would be a little higher. I think wow. the, the I think the issue is is that the local is already more expensive as it is, so you have one hurdle there, and then to go to the organic, which tends to be even a little bit more expensive than that. Uh, don't 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 uh, swing at me through the virtually there, Jim. <laughs> well, Jim, I, I but, may uh, turn to my my yeah. good friend Jim Durst when he's presenting to maybe answer that more specifically, but we'll turn to Jim in a minute. Yeah, I just think that the climate health is uh, is the opportunity there with the organics, mm -hmm. right? How we mm -hmm. treat the land and what's happening, right? Um, and that's the angle that we're playing with our leadership here to keep supporting this program. Well, the other Thanks. aspect too that we can discuss, you know, at a future time um, in some of the literature, it's sort of like also there, are a lot of growers do use sustainable cultivation, soil health practices, regenerative agriculture, they don't have the brand of organic, but they're still farming in a sustainable way. So how to, you know, how to, how does that get captured in a market as well? So, yeah, I mean, as a food hub, you know, the farmer's marketplace, we do not work with any producers that are growing conventionally. We mm -hmm. require, you know, they don't have to be certified organic, but we're looking for organic practices. But I think that could be limiting, you know. Yeah, yeah, for sure. And as trans, as agriculture transitions too, how do we get to the volumes we need to support to supply institutions? Yeah. So, okay. Well, um, are there any more questions for Lon uh, at this point? And please know that you can continue to contact us. As Lon said, we're really eager to have you help us continue to reach out to your networks and we want to build the information base uh, about this. And I think otherwise, um, we'll, and we'll be back in touch again with everybody as well as we go further in the, the analysis for the business plan. But I'd like to turn it over now to um, Jim Durst and Maria McFarish to talk about the, the Food Hub property itself. Grace, do you want to pull up the information there? Yeah, Jim, are you um, able to share screen? I think that you might be on mute right now. There you go. Can you hear me okay? Yes. yes. Thank, you. Thank you. Can you see my screen? Yes. Yes. Okay. Um, I'm Jim Durst, and I'm the, um, well, I wear lots of hats, but the one I'm wearing right now is um, I'm the president of the New Season Community Development Corporation located in the town of Esparto. And um, just about a year ago, we received a grant um, from Yolo County uh, for, um, to purchase a, a site for the proposed uh, Yolo Food Hub. And originally we started out looking in the town of Esparto for a commercial site that would be large enough to house what we anticipated to be a storage facility as well as processing. 
And um, uh, after two or three months and a couple of sites fell through, <clears throat> we started to broaden our search a little bit to some of the neighboring agricultural areas that might also work. And um, uh, this, uh, this site came to our attention. I was, it's, it, was owned, it was owned by a friend of mine, John Foster, who's a, a bee man and his wife, uh, Michelle. And it's located uh, just off Highway 16. This over to your left is the town of Esparto. And over to your right is the town of Madison. And um, right here on Highway 16 is the entrance to the uh, Oakdale Ranch. And this is a historic site. This barn was, uh, let me, it's a little, the site itself is about seven, five acres located right here in this photo. Um, the barn is a little over 20,000 square feet. It's also got a ranch style home on the property. And then it's got a couple of larger spaces that can easily be developed or be part of the infrastructure needed for the, for the, uh, for the food hub. And this is a survey map that kind of shows where things are laid out on, on there. It's got a, a couple of domestic wells and sewage system, septic system for the house. There's also a septic system attached to the building, the barn itself. And um, so it's like most rural areas, it's other than PG&E, they're fairly self-supporting. The barn itself was built in the early 1900s by the, uh, the Stevens family who farmed this property. And the original barn, the original barn is the, the part on the south end here. And this was a livestock barn. And most of the farmers in this area all raised uh, sheep or cows and grew grain. So everything was dry land. This was before irrigation. And um, somewhere in, along the way, this, there, this section going towards the north was added on. And I don't have all the history of it. If you were to look at it from the uh, north to the south, um, it kind of looks like this inside. And these outer sections are all enclosed. And there's uh, the fosters who have a, have a bee service. They also made all their own uh, hives. And so there, part of this area off to the side was wood shops and milling equipment, and they had machining tools. So there was a fairly self-contained uh, business. Here's another view um, looking from the, uh, from the north towards the south. And you can see it, all the, all these old buildings have a lot of character to them, um, all open beam just construction. So, uh, at some point in the construction, uh, a cement floor was added. Most of these buildings were all dirt floor to start out with. A cement floor was added. This building is actually built about four feet above ground level. And I think it was originally designed that way to in anticipation of any flooding. So it's high enough that it would uh, resist any flood waters coming through. Looking at it from the outside, um, this whole area along here is all enclosed, almost like offices, but it, each of these little spaces has a room that had a specific purpose. And uh, the roofs were self-ventilating to keep things uh, cooler in the summertime and also to allow for ventilation for livestock and for feed. And at the very end, this is the original barn. And um, these, these barns were designed for livestock. So the upper area, the loft up here, most people, they still carry, them, carry hay lofts because they used to bring in loose hay. They didn't have hay bales and they would store it up here. And then they would, uh, the livestock would be down below and they would just pitchfork the feed down to them. This area over here was a, with both a grain and a corn crib. And some of this area in here um, was designed for feeding mangers, horses and mule tack rooms, 
everything was in, included in this building. And so um, my grandparents had a, a, a bar not unlike this one, my great grandparents uh, up in the Dundee area. And as we were kids, we'd all play in there. And it was, it was, it was like playing in history. And a few years ago, John built a new facility for his bee business in uh, Lamb Valley. And, and John and Michelle decided to sell the facility. And we, we, I worked with him and he worked with New Season as we were a willing buyer and he was a willing seller. And we closed escrow in July of this year. And the next upcoming activity is um, we are going to have the whole facility engineered an engineer walk through and, and begin to develop a fix it list for the structural components of the building and see what needs to be done to make the transition from a livestock barn into a food hub and a food storage area. So we anticipate this area through the center here to be fully um, uh, paneled with refrigeration panels and um, the uh, basically all aggregated storage with different temperature rooms. And the first phase of this, which Maria will talk about in just a second, yeah, we'll, we'll be dealing with this barn in a, a series of phases as funding becomes available. Maria, are you there? Yes, I'm here. Okay. Um, Grace, uh, can we go back to the slides? I think Grace has a couple slides I can use. Yes, I will. Go. Thanks. Well, so we anticipate uh, rolling out this project in three stages. We're currently in phase one, as Jim was describing, which primarily um, depends on the $2 million that we are receiving from Yolo County from the American Rescue Plan, but also includes um, a mortgage on the residents uh, that is part of the property. So this work includes site acquisition, as Jim described, also the structural repairs that he mentioned, and eventually um, basic build out for about 5,000 square feet of storage space so that we can begin to use the property within a year or so. So this is for this year and next year. We expect that, that part of it at least will be available for storage um, by the end of next year. If we're able to get some additional funding in this phase, we will increase that area from 5,000 to 8,000 square feet and incorporate some conditioning um, of those spaces so that we can have climate control uh, for at least part of it. Phase two, which will be the following year, 2425, um, will expand the facility's capacity from five or 8,000, hopefully to 12,000 square feet, depending on our fundraising. It will also include equipment costs for three processing lines and um, again a bit of budget for the the last round of fundraising phase three which we hope will be in the following year 25 26 would incorporate the uh, the esparto train station property which is where the kp valley farm shop um, currently has a, a food hub and then the train station itself would be the public facing part of the larger food hub project. Um, and that would include a commercial kitchen, retail sales of produce and fresh food, also event and workshop spaces. Um, so that's kind of the big overall uh, plan. Um, I did, I forgot to mention that phase one will include design of a master, master plan for all three stages of work. And that's it. Back thank you, you Maria. Thank you, Maria. <laughs> you know, as a, you can see, it's a it's a really interesting site with a lot of space. There's a lot of work to be done, but we're we're on the way. We're on the path. Um, looking as Maria and Jim mentioned, at some of the design um, uh, needs and opportunities to really create a very sustainable facility that is going to have a lot of capacity. One of the things that the original food hub study 
really identified was the need for all these kinds of um, capacities and especially adding the value add with the processing gives us a lot more opportunity to be responsive to the community needs and add a lot more value for the products of the growers and give the customers more of the kind of products and supplies that they need to. So we're really trying to build a very um, synergistic facility and then work with the network of partners across the region as well. So we applaud New Season Development and the partners for taking on this very ambitious endeavor that we know we can do together. And we are, as mentioned, you know, working on a fundraising strategy to, to complete the rest of the facility. So, and any ideas and contributions are welcome. <laughs> but um, I also wanna ask if anybody has any questions for Maria or Jim on the site itself. Thank you, Fred. I'm looking at the chat, and I and I I want to also note, um, you know, the importance of this facility as the gateway to Cape Hay Valley and the revitalization of Esparto. There's really a beautiful holistic plan for this, with activating other spaces like the train station and working with the Cape Hay Farm Shop. So there's some new activities happening up there too in the valley with um, maybe potential for uh, meat processing facilities. So we really want to make this um, a tremendous asset for the region and the, and the community. Tammy, do you have a question? Yeah, I was just curious, um, you know, in terms of like total funding to date and where those funds came from. I heard the, I think it was 2 million from Yolo mm -hmm. County. That's right. The, the Yolo County funds were from the American Rescue Plan. Um, that's and then we have, of course, the USDA grant that is funding this work on the um, uh, basically the research and, and extension of the SACOG project. Um, there will be a, a mortgage on the residents to fund part of the phase fund phase one work. And then there's a we have a subgroup that's working on uh, additional funding for phase one and phase two at this point. I also like might... There's a question about solar from the in the chat. Yeah. Will your energy needs be met by PG&E, if not perhaps a uh, microgrid toward phase three? So definitely, we are, yeah. yes, we are definitely expecting to, we will be incorporating um, maximum solar panels and, and um, sort of green principles in the design for the facility. Yeah, another aspect, and I see that Alexis here from Cal Recycle, we really want to, you know, do a full sustainability approach to with, um, you know, the water needs, the nutrient repurposing, waste recovery, things like that. So really trying to make the facility as sustainable as it can be and building that into the design right from the start, right, Maria? Absolutely, yeah. Mm -hmm. So, go ahead, Grace. Yeah. yeah. I just want to make sure folks have any questions and we can, if not, we can move on to the closing slide. I also wanted to say that Esparto is, has a, a cut and wrap facility for meat. It's one of the only approved, one of the few approved USDA butcher shops in, in California, local. So, and it was just purchased by the Buckhorn Group out of Winters, and they plan to keep it open for the processing processing of local meats. And um, I think they would also be uh, a, a very important part of the Food Hub Network. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes, and um, to mention also that Yuba County is gonna be working on a food hub a study and I think Tammy and others across the region, you know, we really want to, that's the concept of the network is to work with partners across the region and and uh, hopefully this site can be a tremendous resource, but that was one of the original ideas in the SACOG Food Hub study was to really 
be able have the opportunity to aggregate food across the region and get to food back out to lots of different partners across the region. But as Lon mentioned, there's market opportunities beyond as well. So really the hub is really well positioned where it's located close to the Bay Area. So I think it's a tremendous market asset that way too. So, um, well, okay. Uh, I uh, would like to thank everybody again for being with us this afternoon. We hope you be in touch and provide um, your continued engagement and information with us. Grace has provided some information here for ways to keep in touch. On October 21st, we're going to have a barn warming uh, and community celebration at the site. We want to thank all the funders for supporting us and really just have a, like uh, we're saying a community celebration. It's a huge milestone. Many people have worked on this for, for many years and we're really excited to have the momentum and work with all of you and want to hear from you and learn how we can serve your needs. And um, uh, and yes, Jacob is noted if people want to purchase right now, um, Sport Food Hub works with local farms. Um, thank you, Jacob, already um, and schools. And uh, that's to note too, that we really want to activate the region to increase our farm to school programs and working with the state California Department of Food and Ag. And we'll be continuing to work with our state and federal agencies to try to uh, leverage resources for the network. And then one thing I'd like to note, finally, Valley Vision is holding a livability summit at Sac State on um, October 6th. So we would encourage and love to see you there too, as we talk about the ways that we can make this really resilient and sustainable region. And um, uh, let's see is, so hope to see you there. And there's the information for the barn warming. Hope to see you there as well. Uh, Robert C. from USDA asks a good question. Is local going to include indoor grown? There's models around um, controlled environment agriculture. Um, Gotham Greens is located now in Dixon. So it's part of our conversation is how do we keep the food supply going year round for all of our uh, folks. And then Patrick Mulvaney has noted that Mulvaney's b &L is hosting a watch session for the White House Conference on uh, Hunger, Food, and Nutrition Security next week. We are very excited about that. Patrick was gracious enough to host us uh, last month to do an input session, and we have a policy platform that we submitted through Congresswoman Matsui to, for input to the White House Conference, and so next week is the actual conference. So Thank you very much for that, Patrick. Please contact us if there's anything, more information you need. We really um, encourage people to weigh in and uh, from America's Farm to Fork Capital. And uh, so uh, we're excited to continue to work with everyone. And with that, we are almost at time. So um, again, thank you, everybody. We're really appreciative and um, just have lots of gratitude for our partners to advance this project.